that ain't no easy job. <laughs> and he does the camera work and uh, floor managing and so forth. And oftentimes, <laughs> Brother Tom Bruchet is the, produ the producer, and he and, and Rich hit him downstairs in the production room, and they're giving Leon instructions over the, the headphone. And uh, then the cameraman, he's telling them when to take this shot, that shot, and so forth. And a lot of times I can hear them while I'm trying to teach. And then every now and then, I've been known to say something that didn't, that struck people odd, funny. And occasionally I can hear Tom over the headphones laughing. But more often than not, I hear him hollering at them. And I'm thinking, man, I'm glad these guys love each other because, boy, they, they get, you know, because you're tense right at the moment. I didn't say take that shot, take that shot, you know. <laughs> and see, so, now you're hearing all that and then you're trying to teach too. Keep a straight face. And when they start laughing, they have so much fun doing this, this program, then they'll start laughing and cutting up. And occasionally they'll start hooting. And I'm <laughs> trying to be Mr. Dignified and <laughs> keep a straight face and not waste you know, the valuable tape time and, and stuff. So we, we have a great time. And then we go out and eat supper afterwards and, and because most of the guys do the program come from work. And it's just a great opportunity to fellowship. And I've, I've come to love these brothers. I've been going up there over 25 years, once a month for almost all that time. And uh, you, you come to love and appreciate these people that you work with, you know, and it's just a privilege to, to be a part of that. And I, I say that because when you think about the TV program, it isn't one person doing it. You know, I'm just the pretty face. Everything else. <laughs> I have a face made for radio. That's been my profession, my confession for years. So I, I, I know my place. Tomorrow morning, we're going to start in this room at 9 o'clock. Now, you can have breakfast. There will be breakfast in, in, the, in the, uh, the buffet and so forth. You figured that out already. And I'm not, I'm not worried about you not getting something to eat. But uh, after, we, we, don't have a, we don't have breakfast with the rooms, so we're not going to have a 7 o'clock meeting like we, we did for several years when we did have a breakfast buffet every morning provided with your room. So you're on your own for breakfast, but be, in, be here in this room at 9 o'clock, the children where they go, and we'll have three sessions. Every morning we're going to have three meetings, 9, 10, and 11. And uh, we, th that puts us where we, we just we sing a song, we get together, and we teach. We take a five-minute break, sing a song, get together, and teach. You have to be here. You have to be on time. We're going to start on time, and we'll get going, Okay. And one of the reasons for that is is that 12 o'clock, we need to be out and through because the children over there, they are through. My wife sent me a message this morning. She said the nursery was done at 1130, and you were just starting your third session. Don't do that again. <laughs> she said they had mothers over there, and they were ready to come and march on the main auditorium. So not, not to have moms march, but they're, they're, they're somewhere between, you know, there's, there's 50, 60 children, and then there's another 30 teenagers, and then there's all the, the nursery crowd. I told you this morning, the nursery had 17 kids in it last night, and three of them were girls. <laughs> Just, my, 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 I asked my wife, the race, and she, I said, oh, jeez. You know, there are three or four families here this week that have four boys. Can you imagine? My, my son has four boys. Then Alan, and you guys got four boys, and you guys have got four boys, or three boys and a girl. And you go, they got three boys, and they finally got a girl to rule the roost. <laughs> but we, you go down to Ridge Farm, and, and that's 12 boys. And then the other, other ones that come in, one of the ladies came up from down there. She says, I'm never going to think that Abraham and his family were. <laughs> I'm going to think better of Rachel in the future. <laughs> uh, Sarah and, well, they didn't have, who was had, who had, who it had? The, Jacob had the 12 kids, wasn't Abraham. Who, she got it right. I'm getting it wrong. <laughs> But the point was that, boy, when you, when you have to deal with 12 boys in a, in a, in a confined space, whew, and they're teaching, they're doing okay. But uh, we, that's why we try to stay on schedule as best we can in the morning times and in the evening times. But we'll do that in the morning, 9 o'clock. Brother um, Ed Yarber, Edward is, uh, Edward has always been our kickoff guy for the week, and uh, Edward is going to bring a message in the morning. What we're going to do in the morning sessions is, is we're going to talk about Paul's salvation words, terms that Paul uses to describe the doctrines associated with the great mystery of God, okay? We're going to start off in Romans, the book of Romans tomorrow, and the first thing Paul does in, in, in Romans when he addresses the gospel of grace is he gives you 64 verses of bad news before he gets to the glad tidings.
and the issue of, of men holding the truth and unrighteousness. And that we'll start off with that tomorrow. And uh, then we'll, we'll talk about justification at, at 10 o'clock. Brother, Brother Leroy is going to do that one. And uh, then and justification, you know, that's, that's, that's the righteousness of God that's imputed to us and the security that comes to us because of, of who God makes us in His Son, takes us out of ourselves, and puts us into this wonderful right standing with God that's eternally secure because of the blood of Christ. And then we're going to talk about the issue of the fact that it's all by grace through faith. Because a lot of people agree with all the rest of it. But that verse says that the gospel of Christ is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. It doesn't say it's the gospel of Christ is the power of God and the salvation, period. It says it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. And you need to understand that it's your faith resting exclusively in the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Savior that he died for you to be and rose again for you to be. And that exclusivity of faith. And that will be an exposition and a teaching about how by grace what God accomplishes for us through faith, that trust in Christ alone. And uh, that, so we're going to have a good foundation issue tomorrow. And we'll move on from there. But these are, you know, and you might think, well, I know all about that. I bet you don't. And if you do, these are still, all these verses in Romans were written to believers. You need to preach the gospel to yourself every day. You need to rejoice in who God's made you in Christ every day and remind yourself about it. And so we'll be doing that. And uh, Brother Edward, Brother Leroy, uh, Reed, and then Brother Russ Hargett will bring that last message. Then in the evening tomorrow, Brother Alex Curse is going to bring a message. And our evening messages uh, are really sort of expositions of, of the, the issue of, of, of the mystery program that's given to the Apostle Paul, the various aspects. And we're going to talk about the, 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 the program that's committed to Paul and, and the, the different times where Paul talks about the mystery. And uh, he, each one of them is going to be a, 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 a uh, kind of a, a going through, begin at the beginning, how the mystery begins, how it ends, what the middle's like, what the content of it is, and why it's opposed and that kind of thing. And Paul, when he talks about the mystery, he talks about some of those specific things. And so that's what we're going to be dealing with in the evening. And our, my topic tonight and by the way, that's, that's my notes, okay? Just in case. Somebody's asking me, do, how many notes do you have? That's, you see that? That's, that's, that's at least an hour and a half's worth of notes. <laughs> so don't worry. We'll get through sometime before 9 o'clock. I don't want my wife chasing me down. Okay? <laughs> well, Ephesians chapter number 5, if you will. This, this, is, this is what we're... We, our, my topic tonight is God's great mystery, what it's all about. Uh, we're going to talk about various aspects of it as we go as we go through the program this week uh, when it was revealed why it's opposed what its future is how we make it known but tonight it's what it's all about um, one of the components of the mystery here it is in, in Paul in chapter 3 I'm sorry chapter 5 of, of Ephesians uh, verse number uh, 30. Well, start in verse 28, if you will. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh." This is a great mystery. Watch. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. The standard is Christ and the church. And the truth of your marriage is that your marriage is, is the, the standard for marriage is the standard of, of the relationship that Christ has with the church. Charlie was talking this afternoon about the fact that people turn that on their head and he's dead, dead on right. People say, well, your, your marriage is, and your, your family is a, is a picture of, of, of the relationship between Christ and the church. No, Christ and the church, the relationship that he has with us, that's the picture. If you want to understand your marriage, that's the picture, that's the model, that's the standard. That's the kind of a relationship that a husband and wife are given to have. He, we're, one of, we're flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. We belong to him. 
And we've been made one with him. And we've been put into this living union with the Lord Jesus Christ, so much so that we are called the body of Christ. In fact, if you look back at chapter 3, chapter number 3, verse number... And one of the problems that you have when you teach things like this is everybody's going to go over these verses. <laughs> and you don't want to teach what everybody else teaches. I said this morning that I generally, when I get here, I don't have my message all finished and prepared. That's re And none of the other guys do either, really, because we're always waiting to see what verses everybody else uses that we don't have to use anymore. If, we ha if we're going to use the same one, how to use it differently. <laughs> That's why guys like to preach early in the week, because at the end of the week, you know, you've been pretty much threshed out. <laughs> Verse 1, Paul, Ephesians 3, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now, you know, most of us think you made known to me the mystery. I can keep a secret. You can keep a secret. And not, it's not that big a deal. Verse 5, he says, Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. This mystery, this secret, wasn't revealed unto anyone else. You heard about the lady. She said, I, I, I don't tell. My age is a secret. Since I was 21 years old, my age has been a secret. I've never told anybody my age. Since I was 21, I haven't told anybody how old I am. And her husband says, are you sure nobody knows how old you are? You sure you'll never tell anybody? She said, listen, if I've kept my age a secret for 26 years, I'm not going to tell anybody now. <laughs> Yeah, she was a blonde. <laughs> I te now, you know my wife is blonde. In our house, that's a funny joke. Now, if you take that and, you know, you get insulted by that, well, then go talk to my wife and you'll get over it. <laughs> Probably the smartest person I know, most perceptive person I know is my wife. I don't, it isn't, it's none of that. But it, it's, it's easy to think you keep a secret and you don't. But God kept it, and he kept it hid in himself. It's easy to think God kept a secret, but he just kind of let a little bit of it out. He didn't. Verse 9 says it was hid in God. Verse 9, he says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. So God kept the secret. This is information was never revealed until it was revealed to the apostle Paul. Verse 3, he says, how that by revelation he, Christ, made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ. Notice he calls it the mystery of Christ. Well, what is the mystery of Christ? Verse 6, that, in a, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and protectors of his promise in Christ. The mystery of Christ is really the secret of the body of Christ. But he calls the body of Christ, Christ. You see that? When he talks about the mystery of Christ, he's not talking about the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. He's not talking about the mystery of, the, of, of G Jesus being God manifest in the flesh. He's talking about the mystery of the body of Christ. He literally calls you and me as members of the body of Christ with the identifier of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That is how closely you've been identified with and in the Lord Jesus Christ in the mind of God. You see it again. Hold your hand here and come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. This is one of those exciting things that, well, when you begin to really appreciate who God's made you and you see that it's all about who he's made you in the Lord Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, you know, all the religion and all the, all the other stuff just kind of becomes moot. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now, the illustration is you've got a body, and it's got a whole bunch of members to it, arms, hands, phalanges, legs, toes. You've got all kinds of members in your body. You've got organs. You've got, I love that term, organs. <laughs> Somebody says, how you doing? And I always want to say, you want an organ recital? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you how my heart is, how my kidney is, how my toes are, how my back's doing. You've got all these parts. Now, parts is parts. They're just parts. But then he says, but you're one body. You know, if I'm standing here, somebody who stands up and stands on my foot, what do I say? I can say, get off of me. You're hurting me. Well, he's not standing on anything but my foot. But my foot's me. And in that case, my foot is identified with the totality of who I am. Okay? 
So we're one, we, you got all these parts, but we're one body. So also is Christ. Now, when he says, so also is Christ, look at verse 12. For by, how, how come Christ is this way? For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. He's talking about the body of Christ. Verse 27, he says, your members, uh, uh, one of another. But you, but, what does he say in verse 27? Now you're, you're the body of Christ. And members in particular. You're different members, but you're members of the body. So verse 12, when he says, so also is Christ, he's really talking about so also is the body of Christ. But he doesn't, he just uses the shorthand, Christ. Now that's how closely, how thoroughly we're identified with the Lord Jesus Christ in the body of Christ. That's why he says we're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. You belong to him. Everything that belongs to him belongs belong to him, belongs to him, belongs to you. By the way, that means everything that belongs to you belongs to who? We like that first part, don't we? <laughs> everything belongs to him. His death, I'm crucified with him, buried with him, raised with, with him, walking newness of life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be glorified with him. I'm seated in heaven in places with him. I'm gonna be. We like all that, but we get, then it says, but you know, there's the other side of that. Because if you're identified with him to the place where everything that belongs to him is yours, that means you're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Your bones and flesh belong to him. There's a reciprocal identity there. That's why Paul will tell you the doctrine, then he'll tell you the duty. He'll tell you what to believe, then he'll tell you the behavior that that belief causes. He'll tell you your calling, then he'll tell you the conduct associated with it. That's always the way grace works. Grace teaches us, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. And all these people that tell you that if you believe grace and you follow the grace life and you, and you believe the things that we teach about grace and how God works today, that you'll just sit over and do nothing. Let me just tell you, let me just give you something to think about. The people that tell you that, they, tell you, they, they holler at me and, and our guys for preaching about grace all the time. Go ask them how many people they won to Christ in the last year. I mean, give them some time. Ask them where their assembly is that's producing godly generation after generation of people. I mean, let's, if you know how to do it so much better, go do it. Show me how, and we'll, we'll, I'll sit at your feet and learn from you. But till you're doing that, don't tell me I'm not doing it. And that what I'm teaching doesn't, pre because I know that what we're teaching, what the grace of God, when you teach God's grace, it produces fruit. You know it does. Now, it doesn't produce perfect fruit. But you didn't expect that. Because grace, listen, folks, don't walk through the door whole. You don't read any of Paul's epistles where the people he's talking to are finished products. <laughs> People say, well, I've attained. You know what I do? I say, let him that thinketh he stand, take heed lest he fall. As soon as I begin to think, you know, we're doing something right, I think, uh-oh. Yeah. So it isn't a matter of being perfect. It's a matter of being, you know, somebody said, we're not looking for the perfect church. We're looking for the, you know, the, the purified, the separated what are talking about this being who we are. We're the body of Christ. And there is an, a privilege associated with that. It's not a, a law to beat you in the head. It's a privilege of grace to cause you to rejoice in what's there. Now, as members of the body, go back to chapter 5, Ephesians 5. Paul says that's a great mystery. Now, the word mystery, of course, means the idea of secret. You can't put it, you have to let the Bible put its own definitions on words. And I think David last night identified mystery for you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. We speak the wisdom of God on the mystery, even the hidden wisdom. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret. That's what the mystery is in the Bible. It's a secret. It's hidden. If, you, if it wasn't now made known, you wouldn't know about it. So when you talk about a mystery in the Bible, it's a stuff that was kept secret, but now is revealed to you. He says this is a great mystery. 
This is the great. Here's the issue about in the dispensation of grace. Here is the issue in the the mystery program, and that has to do with the forming of the church, the body of Christ, and who we are. Now you have a body. The purpose of a body is to reveal the life that's inside the body. Is that fair? First Timothy chapter number three. This thing about the great mystery. There's a there's a really a wonderful verse over here. It's kind of a controversial verse. And one of the strange things about the controversy in the verse is the way the verse starts out. First Timothy three sixteen. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And boy, when a verse says without controversy, you'd just better know there's going to be some controversy. <laughs> without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preaching to the Gentiles, believed on in glory in the, in the world, and received up in the glory. The mystery of godliness has to do, first of all, with God being manifest in the flesh. Now, most commentators, most preachers, most teachers in the passage like here, immediately when they think of God manifest in the flesh, think of who? The Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ was and is God manifest in the flesh. You understand? John 1 says in the be uh, that, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by Him, there was not anything made that was made without Him. He's the Creator God. And then the Word was made flesh. You understand that? In the beginning was the Word. So when everything began, He was there. He was the beginner of everything. And the Word was with God. So He's standing here and God's standing there. That's how you're with somebody. You're two different distinct people. In the beginning was the Word. He exists. There He is. And the, and the Word was with God. Separate person. And the Word was God. Now, that's when people get confused. I thought that was God over there, but the Word's God too. That's where we get the doctrine of the Trinity. We call it that. The Bible calls it the Godhead. The idea is that, there, that, there, that there's one God, but He, 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 he lives and, 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 and exists in three separate, distinct people in the Godhead. Now, theologians say, well, you can't understand that. And I don't know that I understand it, but I can understand this. I'm a human. You're a human. We're all humans. Ham and beans, human, human, humans. We're all humans. Everybody in this room, look around you. We all look different. Yeah, you all look different. <laughs> you know, you got, you, got, you got ears and a nose and a eyes and a mouth. And look how different, you, you know, the Lord, you talk about the Lord having a sense of humor. He made a man that could come out looking like all of us <laughs> and women looking like all of us. God made man. He said, mm, I'm not finished. Then he made woman. He said, that's good enough. Couldn't get any better than that. So he quit making things. And then look at what we've done with it. <laughs> but we're all, we're all, you understand, we're all equally human. But look at all the different people in here. A couple hundred people in here tonight. And we're all distinct. And if you can understand how you can be completely and totally equal in your humanity and yet distinct in your, pers in your personhood, you can understand the Trinity. You just understand there aren't but three people in the Godhead that share the essence and being of deity. You and I share the essence and being of humanity. And there's a whole bunch of us. There's only three people. But they are, they are not three manifestations of one person, modalism. That's what T.D. Jakes teaches not that. It's three distinct people, just like you're three distinct, you know, all these different dis distinct people here, but one in humanity. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. That's the Trinity. Then the Word, now you think about that term, that name, capital W, that's his name. What do you do with words? You express yourself, you talk, the chief speaker of the Godhead is the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the person in the Godhead who's going to manifest and tell you what God's like is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is his agreed function. So you have God the Father, God the Son, 
God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son is going to be the one who tells you the Word from the Godhead. The Word was made flesh. This God who created all things then came down and took upon himself your humanity. Now that's where the mystery comes in. That's where the, whoa. That's, now that's what gets unfathomable to me. Where he came and put his life, his deity, in my our humanity. And the word was made flesh, made one of us. He didn't quit being who he was because you can't do that. So he's still he's still God. God can't be less than God, so he's still very God of God, a very God. He's still God. But he adds to who he is by adding our humanity. And the Word became flesh. He came and lived so that you and I can look and see at an objective representation of what deity living in our humanity looks like. That's why Paul says in Philippians 2, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. He wasn't talking about you going back and following the Jewish program that Christ was under back here. He's saying there's a mindset that brought Jesus Christ out of heaven. He's in the form of God. Thought it not Robert to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. What do you do when you make yourself of no reputation? Well, what do you do when you make yourself of reputation? You're going to go stretch your stuff. <laughs> he said, I'm not worried about strutting my stuff. No member of the Godhead lives for themselves. The wonderful thing about life in the Godhead is that every member of the Godhead lives for the other members of the Godhead. In the, in the eyes of God the Father, Jesus Christ has all preeminence. He puts him first above everything else. When you glorify Jesus Christ, Philippians 2 says, who do you really glorify? Confess Jesus as Lord to the glory of God the Father. When the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus said, he won't, he won't glorify himself, he'll glorify me. Every member of the Godhead lives the, the eternal life that God gave you when he saved you, put, gave his life to you, implant, imputed his righteousness to you, and then implanted his life in you. You realize you got a divine implant? <laughs> and that's better than what a doctor do to you, dude. <laughs> of his life. And when you put that life in you, the way that life functions is it instinctively lives for the benefit of others. So what did Jesus do? He made himself of no reputation, but took upon himself the form of a servant. Now, angels were servants, ministering spirits sent forth to you know, minister to them, heirs of society. He didn't take on him the nature of an angel. He went down and took upon himself the nature of a, of a dirt man, man, made out of the dirt of the earth. The lower, lower than the angels. And he did it so that he could be obedient unto death. He did it so that the will of his father he could do. You following me? The way deity demonstrates itself, here's how my life is designed to live in, in your humanity, is an obedience to the will of the father. Come with me to John chapter 5. Now that verse back in 1 Timothy, by the way, when it says about God being manifest in the flesh, I understand why people immediately think that's the Lord Jesus Christ because that's exactly who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He's God manifest in the flesh. But in the context in 1 Timothy, you're not talking about the deity of Christ. You know what you're talking about in the context of 1 Timothy? He starts out, if any man desire the office of a bishop. Then he talks about the office of a deacon. Then he starts talking about the congregation. He says, we, that how thou, thou, thou to know how to behave thyself in the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. 
So when you've got that local church organized and functioning as the church of the living God, at Ephesus there was a church of a dead God. You ever read Acts chapter 19 about great as Diana of Ephesus? She had the image that fell down from Jupiter. They called her the queen of heaven. Israel in Jeremiah 44 was, was worshiping the queen of heaven. Where my church used to meet in, in Chicago on Neva Avenue right around the corner from us, she had a church called the queen of heaven. She's in Chicago. <laughs> She's all over the world. That religion, the Bible calls it Baal worship, starts back there at Babel and with, with Nimrod in Genesis 10 and Genesis 11. It goes all the way through the Bible. Do you ever wonder why people would call a priest father? Here you've got a priest and he doesn't get married and you call him father. <laughs> you say, what's, what's up with that? <laughs> Well, you go back to Judges chapter 17 and you see where, where Baal worship gets introduced into the, into the nation Israel. And you know how it gets introduced? With a priest called Father. It's a religious title that comes from an apostate religion. Most of Christendom today is nothing but a bastardized form of Judaism anyway. Of apostate Judaism, dude. And so you have all that stuff. At, but at Ephesus, there was a church of the living God, the body of Christ. And Paul says, what you need, Timothy, is to go down there and teach that church how to be the church of the living God. Who do you think would be manifest in the church of the living God? The living God. And the living God is going to live Where? Well, the church of the living God, the verse 15 says, is who? Not a building. You, the body of Christ. And when the, when the living God lives in the body of Christ, where do people see him living? They don't, you know, you go to a temple, you go, that's where God lives. That's the shrine where you come worship God and find God. We're the temple. You see, 1 Timothy 3.16 isn't talking about simply the fact that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh is talking about God's purpose in the church, the body of Christ. And when the, when the church, the body of Christ functions properly as it's designed to function, you know what will happen? God will be put on public display in the lives of the believers of the body of Christ and he'll be made tangible and real in terms that people can understand and see Amen. right in their midst. I told you to get John. Stop. Hold on to that and look at Ephesians chapter 3. Here's a passage of scripture that, if you've been to, if you've been around Shorewood or you've been around our April meetings, you've heard me say these things. But I'm convinced that in most grace circles, and by the way, I'm not of the of the persuasion that my job is to go out and tell grace people all the things wrong they're doing. There are some people that all they do is talk about how bad the grace movement is, how the grace people don't do this, the grace people don't do that, and you find out what they're doing is nothing. So I don't pay attention to that kind of stuff. But Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, is a verse that people tend to un misunderstand. You see how it starts? And. What would that tell you? Well, there's something before it that you probably ought to read. Okay, you notice the end of verse 8, that's not a period. So the sentence starts back up in verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given. The grace is that I can preach among the Gentiles, the unchurch of riches of Christ, and make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now, that's not my passage to teach, verse 8. But I'm going to say this. <laughs> Paul said, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's unsearchable because you can't go search it out in the Scripture anywhere else except Paul's epistles. Search the Scripture there, they that testify of me, Jesus told the, 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 the leaders of Israel, and they could go find him in the Old Testament. You can't, Paul couldn't say that. You go back in the Old Testament Scriptures and try to look for Paul's message, there's just a hole, an empty place. Where it's not. 
So I'm going to go out here and preach this unprophesied message. Dispensationally, it's unsearchable, but doctrinally, verse 9 said it's unsearchable, it's hidden God. But doctrinally, that word unsearchable means it's past finding out. There's some things about it you, you, that, that are so far ahead of where you are, it'll crack your skull to understand all. I shouldn't say it that way, but that's verse 10. That by the church might be, might, be, might be known the manifold wisdom of God. So there's a sense in which the unsearchable is this manifold, many-faceted wisdom of God. That's Romans 11.33, use of the word. So Paul says, I want to go preach that among the Gentiles. I want to go tell everybody that God wants you to participate in this message. And my second purpose is to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. Now, the fellowship of the mystery is that stuff back in verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. There's a, a key. And protectors of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Your, your fellow heirs into the same body. There's the fellowship of the mystery. Paul says, I want to make people see the fellowship of the mystery. Now, that word, when he talks about see it, he's not talking so much about understand it. I want to go reveal the mystery. And the reason I say that is he says, I want to make all men see. What's 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14 say? Can somebody quote that right off? No? Look at the verse. 1 Corinthians 4. There you go. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Paul knows that lost people aren't going to see this stuff. How are you going to understand this? You've got to, get very, you've got to, you've got to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to them, get them saved. That's, verse, that's what verse 8 is about. Verse 8 is about going out and revealing it to them, showing it to them. Here's an unprophesied program. Here it is. You need to believe it and trust it. And I want, I want those of you who have believed it and trusted it, I want all men out there, all those lost people out there, to see. I want them to have a visible representation laid in front of them of what that doctrine represents and is. What he's talking about there is a local church. What he's talking about is 1 Timothy 3.16. God manifested that. You follow what I'm saying? You see, so often... People forget the imperative in Paul's epistles of the local church. Paul wrote nine church epistles. He wrote 13 epistles. Nine of them he wrote to local churches or clusters of local churches. He wrote four epistles to individuals who were leaders in local churches. God's design in the dispensation of grace is that the, the work of the ministry be done through gatherings of believers together in communities that organize themselves together for the purpose of doing the work of the ministry. We're not called to be lone rangers out take you know, run, run, us and our tonto out here running around just taking. We're designed, we're called to be the church, the pillar and the ground of the truth, to hold up a testimony that truth is available. Here it is, and at whatever cost it is, we're going to make it known. And that establishing in the... Do now, you see what happens is people take and think a church is the building down there. So to have a church, we've got to have a building. And to build a church means you, get, you run the programs in the building and you get all that religious hoodly do going on. That's the church of the dead God. Yeah. Glory to God, Brother Rick. That's good preaching. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm not talking about denominational stuff. I'm not talking about building a, a hierarchy of a religious movement. The Apostle Paul never, there's nobody in Paul's epistles that's to tell a local church what to do, but they have, they gather themselves together, they organize themselves together to do the work of the ministry, not to lord over and run people, but to do the work of the ministry. And to take that life that is the work of the ministry, get people saved and get them out of Adam and into Christ and have Christ formed in them and have them grow up and have him being living in them and all of your relationships. Have you ever noticed, you know, there's all the people, people for example, the marriage stuff. 
People used to tell me, Brother Rick, why don't you preach about marriage? I said, you know, there's so little in the Bible and Paul's epistle is about marriage. Do you know that? Do you ever go through that and hunt stuff about marriage? There's a whole chapter about telling you who you ought to marry and who you ought not marry, but it doesn't tell you a whole lot, whole lot about what to do after you get married. <laughs> Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, that's about it. Not a whole lot of verses in them. But there's a whole score of verses about relationships. Marriage is the most intimate personal relationship you'll ever have. My sister, my spouse. The privilege to be married to another member of the church, the body of Christ. Well, that's, a, that's my sister, my brother in Christ before everything else. Jesus Christ is in you. Jesus Christ is in your spouse. Can I tell you, he is totally and completely, always and forever compatible with himself. So when you and your other aren't compatible, what's the problem? <laughs> you just answered the problem. You don't need a marriage counseling seminar. You don't need a marriage weekend to refresh your marriage. You know what you need to do? You just need to live in who you are in Christ and handle it that way. You say, but you don't understand. I don't need to understand. I know the answer. Every time you do this, I don't understand stuff, is you're just saying, yeah, but, you know, my, fit, my situation doesn't fit. So I'd rather teach about the relationships. Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4. There are 11 chapters of doctrine in Romans about grace. And then he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. Here's what that doctrine is going to look like when it's in your body working day by day. Ephesians 4 does exactly the same thing. But Ephesians, when Ephesians 4 begins to talk about the deportment and the behavior, it begins to say, now let me show you how it's going to work in the local church. When it's not just you and your spouse, but it's... You remember what he told Adam? Be fruitful. He's already married. Be fruitful and multiply. Now that doesn't mean have a bunch of kids because that's being fruitful. Multiply. Build a culture out here and replenish the earth. See, God's intention is more than just you. It starts there, but it grows. So it starts with you. If you Listen, you can be a complete, whole, and functioning saint. In a lot of ways, more able to serve than not and not be married. In fact, Paul's advice in 1 Corinthians 7 is, if you can take it, don't get married. I knew I'd get an amen. I got an amen on that one. <laughs> That's the reason you need to sit very carefully and go through that chapter. And you think you want to get married, you need to find a verse in that chapter that tells you, yes, I can get married. Young couples come to me time and again. I sit down with them, especially with those I don't know. And I say, you go home and take 1 Corinthians 7 and bring, come back and you show me the verse that says you guys ought to be married so you can be married by faith. Not just, ooh, I found one I like. Because, ooh, you're going to find one you don't like sooner or later. Or you'll find one you like better. That's not the basis. I'm in love. Oh, when he walks in the door, he just sucks the air out of the room when he leaves. Oh. Six months later, you come in and say, you know what kind of jerk he is? Wow, that's so... In I've been doing this five decades, folks. I've talked to every one of you. <laughs> or people like you. <laughs> you want me to start telling on you? Okay, all right, well... <laughs> Some of the funniest stories I can tell about the ministering somewhere is in Willie's church. Uh, <laughs> my point is that it's relationships. Romans 12 tells you how to live in relations. 
the key relationships. And if you want to see the picture of an authentic Christian life, all you do is read Romans 12, Ephesians 4. You want to see the picture of an authentic ministry? Read Ephesians 4. You don't need to go to the seminars. You don't need to make out like you aren't equipped. You are. And that equipping is designed for that life of Christ to live and be put on display in your life, in your relationships. You with me? And just do one thing back here with the Lord, John 5, just so you get this. And I know sometimes people misunderstand these things, but they've been misunderstanding them for 2,000 years. I'm not the first person that will have misunderstood. A lot of times people don't misunderstand you. They just prefer lying about you. And that happens too. Some people have honest disagreements. Some people have dishonest disagreements. The thing for you to do is don't worry about that. The thing for you to do is figure out what the verses say and live in them. John chapter 5, when the Lord Jesus Christ took on your humanity, what does that mean? How is, how is God's life designed to live in our humanity? Well, Jesus Christ came and he said, though he were a son, remember he's God, yet learned he obedience. Well, if he's God, he didn't need to learn anything, but how, so how did he need to learn something? As the man. His humanity needed to learn some things. But if you're God and you can't be weary, Isaiah 40 says, and then you're going to be weary, John 4, Jesus was, how do you do that? He's one person, two natures. He willingly chose to say that my deity attributes, I cannot be weary. I won't use independently on my own. I will only use them at the direction of my Father. Can you follow that? So that I can experience the reality of human limitations. Now, sometimes Jesus exercised nothing but what deity can do. He said, thy sins be forgiven, John Matthew 9. Only God can do that. Only God can forgive sin. But he said, I didn't do that on my own. I did it because my father gave me that to do. Okay? That's the easiest, that's, all, that's the easiest simplest way I know to explain the, what we call the hypostatic union. How you have the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ put together in one person. Notice how Jesus describes it. John 5 verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. You see that? He's not, when he says, I of my own self can do nothing, it's not saying I can't do it. He said, I can't, I'm not going to do anything independent of my Father telling me it's what I need to do. I'm going to live in obedience to His will. Come over to chapter 6, verse 38. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Remember how the, God, how the Godhead lives? All of them live to do the what? The, the will of the other. So Jesus said, here, I'll show you how God lives in humanity. I've come not to strut my stuff. I could. I could kick it up. But I'm going to live in dependence. I'm coming to show you how we live in the Godhead. We live depending on pleasing the other members. Chapter 8. Now, the book of John lays out his deity. John 1, 14, he says, we, he, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. It is the glory of the unbegotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So you want to see his glory, how, how God lives and demonstrates himself in our humanity. That's what Jesus is doing. John 8, verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye are, have, have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I'm, I, I can do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Now, to me, that's, that's kind of clear. 
I'm not doing it on my own. And when you see me doing things that only God can do that demonstrate that I am God in the flesh, I'm doing them because it's the will of my Father that I do them. I'm not doing them independently from Him. I'm doing it because it's His will. Look back at verse 16. Yet if I judge my judgment is true, for I'm not alone, but I and the, I and the Father that sent me. We're doing this together. Verse 26, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Verse 38, I speak that which I have seen with my father. You do that which you have seen with your father. Ooh. <laughs> Come on to chapter 14. I'll we'll start in chapter 12 on the way over there. Verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. But I have not spoken of myself, but my Father which has sent me. He gave me the commandment, which I should say, what I should say, and what I should speak. I know that his commandment is, is life everlasting. And whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Now, Jesus Christ was God, but he was man. And he said, here's how deity lives in humanity. It lives in dependence on the will of the Father because deity doesn't live to do its own thing. It does lives to do the things of the other members. So, in the body of Christ... Deity is going to put itself on display in our humanity. So how is it going to live? How does deity live in our humanity? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by what? The faith of the Son of God. How did Jesus Christ live? Go see how he, how did deity live in his flesh? And I know how deity can live in my flesh. Deity lived in his flesh by living in complete, total dependence on the will of his Father. Christ lives in you by you living in complete, total dependence on your Father. And just like the Father, he told Philip, he said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because the words that I say, the works that I do, that's all came from the Father. I'm doing what the Father said to say, and I'm doing what the Father told me to do. You've seen me, you've seen him. His actions, his attitudes, his will, that's all you've seen when you've seen me. For to me to live is Christ. Paul said, my goal is to have Christ, whether by life or by death, that Christ might be magnified in my body. When you see me, I want you to see. When you see me, I want you to see his thinking. I want you to see his attitudes. And in my relationships with you, whether you're my spouse or my friend or my neighbor or my enemy, I want you to see how he thinks. In these relationships. So if you're going to do that, what do you got to do? You better get you a verse that tells you how he thinks. Now you got to write and divide the word because you start going back here, and he don't think that he doesn't think this way anymore. You see the you see the internal motivation already. All of a sudden, I need to know how to write and divide the word. Now I'm not having to beat people in the head and say you need to do it. They're saying we need to do it. How can can you help me? If you spend a little time just holding up a standard and say, you know, I've got an answer if you'd like to know it and just give them time to need it and know where to get the answer when they need it, you might find people coming to your door. Can I tell you, in our ministry, we have people calling us every week wanting to know how to do these things. We don't just have to chase them down. We, we hunt them down too. <laughs> but you keep doing enough hunting down, raising the standard, and pretty soon you'll come across people that want to know it. Second Corinthians chapter four. Now I got. I've been running some rabbit trails here. I'm not getting to what I want. I was I was going to talk to you about something that I just want to play around with a little bit. I'm not getting there. Look at the clock, and I'm saying, ah, "Come on, Richard, move on." But what I'm doing right now, I'm trying to say something to you that you need to hear, because this is the key component to your to how the Christian life functions. 
Because the goal is to have God manifest in your flesh, to have Christ living in you. Second Corinthians 4, verse 10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest where? In our mortal bodies. Now, if you go back to verse 7, he says, we, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted. That's a bunch of tough stuff. That sounds like life, doesn't it? Somebody was asking this morning in one of the meetings earlier today about, uh, you know, how, do you fit, how does Monday treat you? <laughs> you know, you think that verse 8 and 9 sort of sound like Monday. You ever hear that Johnny Cash song, Sunday morning coming down? This sort of sound like them. Always, and all those things, bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. I'm just trying to make the point that the life of Christ is designed to live in you and out through you and be manifested, put on display. People are designed, it's designed for them to be able to see the fellowship of the mystery in your life and ministry. To see the fact that you have a complete, intimate fellowship. You're fellow heirs. You're the same body. You're partakers of His price, promise in Christ through the gospel. And that's to impact your life. It's to mean something. It's to transform your life. And you're not being the church of the dead God out there, the religious system. You're completely away from it. We'll see a verse about that in a minute. And you're just living in who God's made you in Christ. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 in one hand and Psalm 139, because if I don't do it that way, I'll never get over there. Colossians 3. And Psalm 139. Colossians 3, verse 16. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. When something dwells in you, it settles down and it's at home. And if it's at home, people are going to see the lights on and they're going to know it's home. What's to dwell in you? The Word of Christ. Now, I got thinking about that. Look back at I'm, I, now. I, I'm. I want to talk to you. Some. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not preaching right now. What I just did up to now, I was teaching. I want you to understand that. Now I'm just going to throw something out to you. That to me is fascinating. I've been working on this, been thinking about this for a couple of years. I, we go down to Brother Morris's in, in, in September, and I thought for the last couple of years about teaching some of this down there, and I just have never worked it all out. And maybe if I get some of it all worked out, I'll do it down there sometime for a weekend. But there's a, there's a strange passage in Psalm 139 where David, he says in verse 15, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet they, there was none of them. 3,000 years ago, David knew something about what happened to him when he was created. Now, this passage really is talking about the creation of man, Adam. David knew something about how you and I were created. You see where he says there, In thy book all my members were written, which then in continuance were fashioned. I remember back in the time of Bill Clinton, how many of you don't remember Bill Clinton? <laughs> well, he's still around, but I mean when he was president. When he was president the first time, he'd been president maybe a year or two, and there came a news thing on about the human genome program. You remember that back in the 80s when it first came out? And I, Clinton was a very intellectual. He, he enjoyed being president because it let him nose into everything, and everything wasn't bad that he nosed into. So... 
he had all this stuff brought to him. And I remember there was a, a magazine article about how he was excited he was, and he took the whole day and just consumed all this information. The human genome system, it, that's, that's where we get our understanding of what is called DNA. You know what that is. I'm not going to do a science lab for you. But DNA is the basic genetic structure of your makeup. Okay? What they've learned about DNA is that DNA really is not a random bunch of garbage in a can. DNA has letters that when you put them together form words, that when you put them together form sentences, they have stops, periods, they have paragraph marks, and it literally reads like a book. And scientists can only read just a small, like, like 7 or 8% of it. But before you were anything except that little bitty one, 23 chromosomes of mama and 23 chromosomes of dad that joined together to make the 46 chromosome package that you are, that package already said my eyes were going to be blue. My skull was going to be a certain way. All of my members were written out. It already said I was going to have my daddy's hands. All of that was written. And then it just was continuously developed as I grew. So everything about you is originally written in that little genetic package that we call DNA. And it's not a random sequencing, but rather it's, it's, it's really like a book. That's what he calls it. But you notice he calls it, in thy book, all my members were written. So who really wrote the book of DNA that makes up you? God did. You with me? What they're doing now is they're trying to read it. And you know what they're trying to do now? They're trying to rewrite it. You know what GMOs are? Genetically modified or they take that DNA and they read it and they rewrite it. And I say, wow, isn't that interesting? Because you know what? God wrote another book. So I get to thinking, well, if God wrote the book of my DNA and then he wrote another book, Isaiah, he says, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read so when I'm seeking out the book of the Lord and reading, what am I really going to be reading? I'm going to be reading the divine DNA that, of God's life. Jesus said, the words that I speak into you, they are spirit and they are life. So where would the divine DNA be? It would be in the book. So I go, wow. Now that's weird. And so I get to thinking. Look with me at Genesis. Now just, 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 just look at your Bible just a minute. This, this is this is something that's. Well, people say, oh, "Rick, you're nuts." You know, you just uh, not say, hmm, "I don't know, maybe I am." Genesis chapter number five. Look at that word Genesis. What do the first four letters say? Oh, what? Oh. Isn't that interesting? Genesis 5, 1, the book of the generations. What are those first five letters, four letters? Now i got a book of genes. You know, that's the first time the word book shows up in the Bible. And in the Bible, the first time a book shows up, it's a book of genes. It's a book of DNA. You say, now, nah, come on, brother. Well, yeah, just, I'm not through. Look with me at Luke chapter number 8. Luke chapter 8. And I, you know, you want to think I'm nuts, you go ahead and think I'm nuts. It's okay. Luke chapter 8, verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed, all in the seed, in that little plant seed, the DNA of the plant, everything is going to be is in that seed, isn't it? And what does that verse say the seed is in the parable? The Word of God. So there's DNA for the plant, 
And it's all in that seed, and then it's just going to continuously manifest itself as it grows. And that is the Word of God. The DNA is in the Word of God. Acts chapter 12, he said the Word of God grew and multiplied. You ever read that verse? He said, but that's what life does, isn't it? It grows. So I say, hmm. But God's made this connection in there. If I stand up here and I turn around, what's right at the middle of my back? Your spine. Your spine divides your your back, your body into two parts. Left side, right side. How many of you are left handed? Okay. The rest of you are right handed. If you if you're right handed, your right hand is dominant. It's stronger. Your left hand is weaker. What your spine does is divide you into a weak side and a strong side. Okay? Twelve ribs on one side, twelve on the other. It divides you. You take your Bible. Your Bible's got a, what do you call that? Called a spine. It's got a, a spine to it. You know, in your spine, there are 33 bones in your spine. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I started having some back problems. So I start reading. I got 33 bones in my spine. And so you start thinking, wow, 33 bones in your spine. Divides your body right into half. One side, the other side. One side, the weak side. One side, the strong side. There's a, there's a spine goes down the middle of my Bible. Divides my Bible into one side, another side. The law... What's it say about the law? It was weak through your flesh. Be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Where's the strength going to be? There. I say, hmm. There are 66 books in your Bible. If you divide 66 by 2, what do you get? There's your spine, Okay. There are 189 chapters in the Bible. Somebody got a calculator to divide 189 by 2 for me. 1189 divided by 2 is what? It's 594 and a half. I'm not good at math. I did it myself, wrote it down. <laughs> so what would the middle chapter of the Bible be? Well, it would be if you had 90, 594 and a half, well, you can't have a half a chapter, so you'd have, it would have to be the 595th chapter. You'd have 594 chapters, the middle chapter, and then 594 after it. So turn with me to the, the 595th chapter of your Bible. <laughs> oh, you, you, you know what that is? So, it's Psalm 117. This is the, this is the middle chapter chapter here's the spine of your Bible the middle chapter chapter wise Psalm 117 praise the Lord all ye nations praise him all ye people for he is merciful kindness is his merciful kindness is great if you counted the words in those two verses could you guess how many words there are in those two verses 33, exactly. The spine of your Bible, the backbone. Now, I don't know why your backbone has 33 chapters, 33 bones in it, or why that verse has 33 words in it, except there's a comparison. You with me? How was the Lord Jesus Christ when he died? You remember Moses? God said, he said, show me your, show me your, your glory. And he said, I can't, you can't see my face because if you do, you'll die. So I'll show my, you my what? My back. Backside. You know what chapter that is? Where that's found in your Bible? Exodus 33. You say, hmm, Rick, I knew you were nuts. <laughs> well, let me prove to you. You have 46 chromosomes. 23 from mom, 23 from dad, 
come together and you get this DNA package of genetics that make you. Okay? Come with me to Genesis chapter 2. By the way, God used two languages to write the Bible, Hebrew, and he also used Aramaic, but Aramaic uses the Hebrew language, Hebrew alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet and the Greek alphabet. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet and there are 24 letters in the Greek alphabet. If you add 22 and 24, what do you get? 46. Okay, that's just that's a coincidence, but it's just... Actually, Genesis chapter 2, Genesis 2, verse 23... Now, here's, the first, here's when God married Adam and Eve. Uh, Genesis 22, verse 23. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she is taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be cleave, cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. That's the quote. There's the quote about the one flesh, the joining of the 23, 23, the producing of 46 chromosomes that makes a kid, and there they become one. You don't know how many words are in that quote of Adam? That's a good guess. And you'd, bingo, you'd be right. I read that and I say, hmm, ain't that interesting? Now, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, 17, along in there, he talks about that one flesh, and then he say, you see that in the human terms? He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. Our birth into Christ, being begot by the gospel to produce one spirit, he uses it and says it's a parallel in the physical realm, one flesh, the 46 chromosomes, is a parallel to our spiritual identity in Christ. He just keeps connecting those two things together. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You know what the 46th book in the Bible is? Start in Genesis and go through. Count it up. Matthew's 40. What's the 46th book? Well, 1 Corinthians would do. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. This is the 46th book in the Bible. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Chapter 6, verse 19. Know what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of God? The 46th book talks about you and I being the temple, the place where God lives. He lives in your body, inside of your DNA there. He exists. Now, I read that. That's kind of interesting because if you go back to John chapter 20, when Herod built the temple that Israel used in the time of Christ and time of Paul, you know how long it took him to build it? John chapter 20, verse number 20. I'm sorry, John 2, verse 20. John 2, verse 20. The Jews said, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> when Moses built the tabernacle, God said, go out here and build the tabernacle. It's all made out of skin, but it's got a, it's got a structure to it. It's got, got bones and uh, boards and stuff to hold up, hold up the, 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 the skins. And he put four posts in the beginning of it out here, which matched the four pairs of the, gen of the genetic code. And down one side of it, the north side, he put 20 boards. Down the south side, he put 20 boards. And across the back side of that temple, that tabernacle, he put six boards. That's the temple, the tabernacle. You're the tabernacle. By the way, if you go, I, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm going to quit. First Kings chapter Seven, when Solomon built the temple, he built a porch and he put two pillars with lilies on top. You want to guess how tall each one of those pillars were? They were each one 23 cubits. When he went inside and he built a staircase... He built a spire. It's called a winding stairs. Have you ever seen a picture of DNA? It's got two pillars on the outside and winding stairs on the inside. If we had time, are you familiar with Fibonacci numbers, anybody? Yes. If you do any invest, investing, you know Fibonacci numbers are some of the greatest tools of, of percentages, tools in people use investing in stock market. All, all science, is the, most, the purest science, Einstein said, is math. Fibonacci numbers are... Fascinating. Did you know that Fibonacci numbers produce that spiral? This thing in your ear right here, every person in this room, your ear 
is in the pattern of a Fibonacci circle? Why is that? Because God wrote it in his book of DNA when he wrote you. There's ordinances to it. There's patterns to it. There's a connection between our DNA and the DNA of the Bible. That's my point to you. Proverbs chapter 3 says, When God created the heaven and the earth, He used wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. He put it in His creation. Paul says, In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Are, is this making any sense to you? I'm just saying there's, there's this connection. Now, the reason it's important to me is that the DNA of the Lord Jesus Christ, His life lives in me, and that life is in His Word. So there's this spiritual DNA of the Lord Jesus Christ that lives in me, that's designed to live out through me, and there is a connection in there. And I say, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, I said to you, people are trying to rewrite the DNA. Paul said, we're not as those as many which corrupt the Word of God. There are people trying to write the, rewrite the spiritual DNA, too. Come with me back to a verse in Proverbs, and I'm going to have to think about quitting because my wife is going to be. You hear little feet coming down the hall out there? <laughs> Warn me. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm going to preach a little bit now, okay? Just let me preach to you a minute. Proverbs 15, verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein in your tongue is a breach in the spirit. You know what a breach is? It's a hole in a wall. You know what God did with Israel? He was always concerned about breaches because he gave Israel walls for salvation. He separated Israel apart from the nation and he built a wall around them and he called those walls salvation because their protection was in staying separate unto who God made them. And he said, the enemy is always trying to knock a hole in the wall and get in and cause you not to be who God made you to be. Look at Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter number 7. Isaiah 7, verse number 5. By Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remelah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying. So here are three dudes that have come up and they're taking evil counsel against Israel. What are they going to do? Let us go up against Judah and vex it. Let's go up there and just start beating on them. And look and see if we can't find a weak spot in that wall. Let's go up there and find the place where we can get in. And let us make a breach therein for us. Let's just go keep trying them and pushing and hitting and beating on them until we find a weak spot we can get in. And set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabela. You see what they want to do? They took evil counsel. And they wanted to get an opening. And they, wanted, they, they just kept vexing them, pounding on them, trying to find that weak spot so they could set the wrong king over them. They could have the wrong person, the wrong one ruling them. And they could go in and go out and do whatever they wanted to do with them. And God said, I put a wall around you to save you from that. He separated them. And Israel had enemies all the time. Can I tell you that in your life, I'm going to spiritualize it, in your life, the world, the flesh, and the devil, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh is going to be beating on your life day in and day out, beating on your relationships day in and day out, trying to find a breach, trying to find a place in your mind and your thinking that it can get through and plant an evil king to run your life. You need to be careful to keep the wall strong. You say, what are you talking about? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. This is a verse that doesn't go to church too much. 
2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's something you need to think about. Just go through your house tomorrow morning or next Friday when you get home. Don't go home till then. But when you do, go through your house and find all the unbelievers in the house and throw them out. Some of you pay good money every month to have it pumped into your house. I do. I got cable TV. We like me TV. We like to watch old Andy Griffin. But you know the problem with Andy? Is there's another channel. And he wants to get a breach and wants you to look at it. And pretty soon you listen to people yell at each other and scream at each other and cuss at each other. And you get all upset and mad about the breakdown of marriage and all this kind of stuff in our culture. Listen, it happened 40 years ago and you didn't raise a peep. The sexual permissiveness of the 60s is the source of almost all of what goes on in our day in the attack on marriage and the family. I watched Megyn Kelly on TV a couple of months or so ago when all this stuff was going on and this preacher down in Texas, Jeffries or whatever his name is from Dallas, he was on there with her and she was pontificating about the homosexual ruling that the Supreme Court was going to make and he said, you know, all kind of sexual permissiveness is the problem premarital sex and when he said that she turned red as a beat and he says she said wait a minute now you're talking about me <laughs> when you've got people that profess to be guardians of the constitution and guardians of the conservative america and it's their lifestyle and you or nobody else says a word about it and you'll keep your mouth shut about it because you get economic and social and 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 and, and cultural benefits from it Don't stand up and start blowing off about people. But, oh, the country going to... Listen. The answer is not yelling about the country going to hell. The answer is teaching truth about it. A nation, the course of a nation is determined by the amount of sound doctrine resident in the hearts of its believers, of its citizens, I should say. And one of the greatest... Listen, what builds a nation? Volition... Marriage, family, nationalism. And when this falls over here, it's because family fell. And that fell because marriage fell. And that fell because volition didn't do its job. And your life's going to be beat on to get a breach. And it's going to start right over here where the, where, where the change comes. Because you're going to have to make a choice, mister, and your family. To be the man, the husband... The head of your house, God called you to be. Go read the verse and say, I'm going to stand on that verse. Lady, you're going to have to decide to be the wife and mother God gave you to be. And you're going to need to go get the verse and say, I'm going to stand on that verse. I might not like it. I'm going to stand on it anyway. Because I ain't going to like what the consequences are if I don't. And I'm going to trust God's word to do what it says it'll do. And you let that breach come in and begin to say, yeah, but, you know, we couldn't. We've been mystery. We've been. You let all that come along. Bye, Charlie. And a different king's going to come and run your life. And he's going to have access in and out. And you're going to wind up not being able to stop him. Don't you think Israel was doing something that, that happened to them that couldn't happen to you? 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be not equal, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what, what uh, communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he with the, that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Whoa. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, walk in them, and I will be their God. They will be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. He didn't say don't eat it. He said don't even touch it. And the unclean thing in the passage in the quote from Isaiah 57 is a religious system that controls your thinking process. And I will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters. 
saith the Lord Almighty. That's the only time he's identified as the Lord Almighty in the New Testament outside the book of the Revelation. You think Paul wasn't serious about that? He said, you keep yourself separated to the identity God's given you. It isn't enough just to know, hey, what's, what's the mystery? It's the body of Christ, fellowship, the mystery. That's all, all these things we have in Christ, and he belongs to us, and we belong to him. It's taking that seriously. And said, if that's who I am, that's who I am. And if God's built a wall around me and, and put me inside that encapsulized environment of God, the Holy Ghost, I'm going to live there. And that's going to, what that's going to look like in my life, I'm going to manifest. That's what somebody who is a saint of the Most High God is going to look like when he lives in my family, in my job, in my neighborhood, in my community. And the decisions I make are going to be based on that. Not if it's my economic advantage or my social advantage or somebody else getting ahead of me. That's who I am. This world is not my home. I'm not trying to have this world be the answer for my problems. I'm here as an outpost of heaven to tell them the answer to their problems. And I'm not trying to build a monument to me or a, or a, or a religious machine that's going to go out here and do a bunch of stuff that God never gave anybody to do anyway. I'm here to try to make all men see what faith in Christ really does and what it produces. And he'll be a father to me. Paul says, as a father with a son, Timothy served with me. He is our father. But he'll be a father to you. You know, you can have a bunch of baby mamas. You can be a sperm donor, donor dude. But being a father is different. And God is not in the business of having a bunch of baby donor kids. He said, I want to be your father. I want to be a father to you. I already am your father. I want to be that. To, I want us to have that relationship. I want us to live in that fellowship. Can I tell you as a dad, the greatest thing I think a father ever has is when he has his children stand up and make decisions in their life based on the truth of God's word. Not because somebody else tells them to do it, but because that's the choices they've made. Because that's how dad got where he's at. I'll be a father to you. And you'll be able to understand and appreciate that. Jesus Christ lives in us. He's our life. He's our very DNA. He's what we're growing up to be. He's being formed in us. And as that word dwells in us and continuously grows and forms Christ in us, don't go around letting somebody substitute GMOs for you. False dividing, false identity, breaches in the wall to let in corruption. Listen, it's going to pound you. Looking for weak spots. Be strong in the graces in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Put on display the stage where you live. His righteous character. Let the fruits of who you are in him live. So people can see who he is in you. His attitudes, his act. Listen, it's when you cherish, when you treasure, when you value, when you esteem him, his attitudes, his thinking, his will, his direction above everything else. When people see you make choices because that's what God says. And I'm choosing that because he's more valuable than any of this other stuff. When people see that, they see Christ in you. What's this mystery all about? It's putting him on display 
so people can see that truth. Unto me who is less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I might preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Oh, come here. My little grandkids, they're always wanting to buy something. And I tease them, oh, come buy without money. Go see Grandma. <laughs> And God says, here it is, it's a gift. Walk in it by faith. Understand who God's made you and rejoice in that. Let that be enough. Take it personally and let it be everything. If you're here tonight and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, heaven's to murgatory. You've got to see there's a difference between religion and what we're talking about. If you've never personally passed from death to life, had God's DNA implanted in your spirit, I can't do that, but he can. It's a divine transaction. Don't leave here tonight without getting that settled. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to talk to anybody. You don't have to move a muscle. If you had to do that much, you'd never know if you did it right. You don't have to pray. You have to make any deals with God. You don't have to tell anybody. God looks at your heart and wants to see your faith resting in his son. When you make that choice, God will do everything else. If you've never done it, right in the quietness and stillness of your heart, that's the choice you need to make. You need to tell God right now, I'll trust your son to be the Savior he died and rose again for me to be. And you watch what he does for you. Those of you that are saved, you need to take it personal. You need to be take, begin to take, make a decision right now, this is going to be real for me. It's not going to be just doctrine. And I'm going to be on guard. Father, we thank you tonight for life in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to stand and sing just real quick, Christ is all that he claimed to be. Christ is all that he claimed to be. It's number 39 in your book if you need it, but you shouldn't need it. <laughs>